started. Um, I want to do a quick thank you to everyone who's joining us tonight. Um, and a reminder that you can ask questions using the Q&A feature throughout the evening. We will be having um, Jesse and Paul answer them near the end of the evening, but feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A at any time. Um, and now I would love to hand it over to our one of our very special guests tonight, Paul Bloom. Um, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Paul Bloom. I'm a professor of psychology at Yale University, and I'm here to, uh, to introduce and then talk to Jesse Single. And um, I have mixed feelings about Jesse Single. So, on as, as do most on, people. As do most people. On on the, there, there's a fair number of reasons for somebody like me not to like somebody like him. He um, he he does a lot of writing, a lot of journalism, but part of his beat is psychology. And he has criticized some of my favorite people in the world, and some good friends of mine, some people at the pinnacle of of, of my scientific field, people I respect people who do who who are, are important in the field and the positive thing about Jesse is these criticisms are really good he's the best critic of psychology I have ever read um, I got to know his work because he wrote an article for New York magazine on uh, implicit attitudes about five years ago and it was so good that I assigned it as a required reading for my intro psych course at Yale for hundreds of students each year and reading reading Jesse's work um, he's very well informed he's very sharp and he knows this stuff. And one thing which shines through also is he's fair. He's very critical of the work, but he's also generous. He never attributes bad motivations to people. He, he puts things in context. He's a sort of critic that you could really uh, learn from. And I read his book and I totally love it. It's, it's readable, it's clear, it's, it's funny, it's engaging. And it's also important. I think we're all consumers of, of psychology. Um, psychology tells us a lot about race about education, about COVID, about vaccines, about every aspect of political policy and social life is pervaded by psychological research. And I think it's absolutely essential to be an intelligent consumer of this research and, and reading uh, the quick fix is a great way to do it. So um, I'll hand it over to Jesse. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, it means a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad I get to do this event with you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just going to read a little bit and then Paul and I are going to talk and then uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from chapter four, which is about positive psychology, uh, particularly a program called Comprehensive Soldier Fitness. This has been a mandatory part of army life uh, for about a decade now, a little more than a decade. It has cost taxpayers probably about $500 million. It's billed as a way to prevent PTSD and suicidality among soldiers. Uh, as my chapter argues, there's no evidence it does anything. And there was never any evidence to think this particular program could prevent PTSD or suicide. Uh, a few names are going to come up in this excerpt. Uh, Marty Seligman, he's one of the founders of Positive Psychology. He was the guy who successfully sold Comprehensive Soldier Fitness, as this program is called, to the military. It was based on a pre-existing program him and his Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania had developed. Uh, the other name is Colonel Jill Chambers. She was tasked by then Admiral Mullen to basically go around the country, talk to military personnel, figure out how the army should handle what was then in the late aughts, a major PTSD crisis. Uh, she found her way to Seligman. Seligman convinced the army he was the guy. The rest is, is history. Uh, and then finally, Patricia Rezik is the creator of cognitive processing therapy that is a validated treatment for PTSD. With that, <coughs> excuse me. Treating military PTSD isn't pretty or easy or photogenic. Many of Patricia Rezik's patients have been part of seven, eight, nine deployments, as she told me, and have endured trauma most of us couldn't imagine. They're seeing their friends being blown up. They're picking up body parts. They're nearly being killed themselves. They're having post-concussive syndrome, she told me. And by the time they get to Rezik, they have often internalized certain ideas about the nature of war and agency and responsibility that are very important to the military but directly counterproductive to the goal of recovering from trauma. <clears throat> a common task with our patients, she said, is undoing the learning that they learned while they were in the military. And it's pretty hard because a lot of my studies are with active duty and they're still being what I would think of as brainwashed. For example, Rezik explained that as they are trained for combat, soldiers are often given some version of the storyline, if everybody does their jobs correctly, everybody will come home. 
But reality's messiness often defeats military mottos. And in real life combat, that one's plainly false. And so everyone didn't come home, Rezik explained. And now they look to themselves and they look to the person next to them and say, what did we do wrong? Someone must not have done their job or we would have all come home. That's ludicrous. I mean, you plant a mine deep enough, nobody can see it. It has nothing to do with how well you did your job. If you're taught over and over and over again, and you're only 19 years old, and your brain hasn't finished developing, that if everybody does their jobs okay, then everyone's coming home, then they feel guilt. Soldiers tend to be young, so their executive functioning in their brains hasn't even finished developing yet, as she told me. They get these rigid kinds of ideas, and we've got to spend our time kind of undoing their learning and helping them really look at the context of the event and how there wasn't anything they could do at the time. The buried IED was not to be seen. How many other people were there who didn't see it? Why is all this blame falling on you? Resnick's insight is as fascinating as it is heartbreaking, and it brings to mind the World War II veteran and performance artist Audie Murphy's line about post-war treatment of veterans. After the war, they took army dogs and rehabilitated them for civilian life, but they turned soldiers into civilians immediately and let them sink or swim. To actually treat PTSD often entails deprogramming the military's very own messages. You need to make people realize they did not have control over situations that were in fact chaotic and violent and incomprehensible. The training that was designed to help make individuals better fighters and to improve the chance they would get out of these situations alive can be a roadblock to their full recovery from trauma. Sometimes the cognitive distortions are coming from inside the house. I keep going back to Jill Chambers, a kind, energetic, intelligent woman who genuinely wanted to help soldiers. I keep going back to all those interviews she conducted with experts and with soldiers. I keep going back to the question of whom she was most likely to listen to and why. Back to unskilled intuition and the very army specific ways it manifested itself in this story. Seligman and positive psychology speak the same language as the army. The army was made to believe it could simply double down on the same messages it had always sought to impart. Messages about toughness, resilience, and optimism, and in doing so, ameliorate a PTSD crisis. The simple, inspiring mottos that define military culture embody a great deal of what Seligman and his field of positive psychology stand for. Individuals have significant potential to improve their situation and their probability of success, so long as they embrace hard work, dedication, and an optimistic attitude. There's nothing wrong with telling people to be optimistic and hardworking and dedicated, of course. It's a truism that all else being equal, a well-prepared person will fare better than an ill-prepared one. But wartime PTSD is one of many complicated human problems that doesn't quite obey this sort of logic, at least, at least not lately. There's little evidence teaching people resiliency or optimism skills can shield them from PTSD. <clears throat> the absence of evidence that the Penn Resilience Program and Comprehensive Soldier Fitness actually work as anti-PTSD interventions as well as evidence that other approaches do on average work, at least as far as treating trauma that has already been inflicted, was right there in the literature all along. Patricia Rezik and Richard McNally and Edna Foa could have told anyone who asked, and in some cases did tell those who asked, that what the army was rolling out was based on no one's expert understanding of PTSD. But it didn't matter. The program slid too effortlessly into military ideals and was such a big, important seeming, attention getting response to the crisis that it attained a formidable internal momentum and quickly snowballed on the basis of its own overheated promises. <clears throat> or, phrased differently, imagine Marty Seligman and Patricia Reza competing for the same giant military contract. During Seligman's presentation, he explains how his idea, comprehensive soldier fitness, will help reinforce values the Army already holds dear. Self-possession, hard work, respect for, and trust in authority. The trainings can slot right into soldiers' other responsibilities. Soldiers can be trained up as master resilience trainers. A relatively simple, universal intervention will make the military stronger in an easy, convenient way that won't interfere with anything. It will save lives. Best of all, adopting this program will allow the Army to broadcast out to America inspiring scenes of soldiers receiving life-enhancing training and of master resilience trainers fanning out throughout the army, imparting these messages at the unit level. And as a result, countless tragedies will be averted. This is a remarkable revolutionary opportunity to nip army PTSD and suicidality in the bud en masse. Then Resnick gets up to make the case that the grant should go to her and to her cognitive processing therapy approach, 
This is actually less straightforward than what Marty just posited, she explains. Post-traumatic stress disorder isn't about a lack of optimism or a failure to hunt the good stuff. It's much more complicated than that, and there's no evidence it really can be prevented. And treating it involves carefully unpacking soldiers' thought patterns and, in many cases, undoing the military's very own teachings. At the end of the day, if you send young soldiers into deadly situations and allow terrible things to happen to them, you need to approach the aftermath in a careful, responsible, evidence-based way. There's no simple solution here, no quick fix. Trauma is trauma, and it's ugly and takes time to unpack. And if she's being honest, she can't really claim, as Marty did, that beefing up the Army's investment in cognitive processing therapy will bring with it PR opportunities. These stories aren't inspiring. They involve young men sitting with a therapist talking about the worst days of their lives and their lingering feelings of guilt and anger about what happened on those days. Sometimes they're crying. It's hardly ever photogenic. Who do you think gets the contract? Okay. Um, that's very moving. It's uh, so it, what you're presenting is a case of, you don't put it this way, but, but in some way, scientific malpractice by, by psychologists or by, by one psychologist in particular, by the movement of positive psychology. And I think I know why you chose that example to get started because it kind of reflects a general theme of your book. So your book covers a wide range of domains. It covers, talks about uh, the panic over so-called super predators. You have a lot of implicit bias, which I want to talk about a bit. You talk about grit, about the self-esteem movement. So let's talk a little bit. I want you to hear sort of what pulls it all together. What's the theme? What's your problem with psychology, man? You, you call your book the quick fix and what's wrong with quick fixes? You know, there's nothing wrong with sort of cheap, cute psychological interventions that can do a little bit good at the margins. And uh, I have a chapter on nudges, you know, yeah. uh, moving desserts to the back of the cafeteria or defaulting people to uh, enroll in their 401k. Stuff like that's great and it can do some good. Uh, the gripe I expressed throughout my book is this idea that these cute tweaks can solve really big, complicated problems, problems like military PTSD or societal racism or the gender gap in the workplace. And I've just found that like, there's something about the gravity of excitement and, and, and excitement's ability to build on itself or one of these ideas, once, once one of these ideas gets the TED talk treatment, it sort of like becomes the way we talk about that issue. And oftentimes there isn't a really great reason to focus on that particular thing other than that there's been a handful of exciting studies or a TED talk about it. So I, I just think that has a pretty distortionary effect on the conversation and comprehensive soldier fitness is sort of a worst case example because we yeah. can put an approximate price tag on it. <clears throat> so is the problem that you can see different and the answers may be all of the above, but is the problem that psychologists overhype their research? I got, you know, I got some studies that work with young kids or with adolescents. Let's take it to the military and solve our problem. Is it overhyping or is it that there's something wrong with the field that, that we really couldn't even in principle solve the problems that we're supposed to solve? I think there's um, multiple, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I, I think there's multiple levels to this because some really smart quantitative heads figured out um, really in the last 10 years, how easy it is to generate false positive findings in psychology or in any field based on the, this type of statistics that psychologists and everyone else uses. So part of it is just psychologists sort of fooling themselves. And, and you'll hear, um, you know, I think your friends on uh, very bad, uh, two psychologists, four beers, um, great psychology podcast. One of them, I think it was said like back in 2010, we did not understand how easy it was to generate false positive results. So that's part of it. But then part of it is that whole TED talk thing. And there's examples of my yeah. book of, you know, psychologists finding this, and then they give the TED talk and they say they found this. And then the book, they say they found this and it gets bigger and bigger till the, the version that's being presented to the public bears almost no resemblance to the actual finding. Uh, assuming the finding was valid, which it might not be for the reasons we just discussed, but it's just this, this process of hype gets really bad because there's a lot of people, including journalists, who want it to be the case that, that these uh, interventions are miraculous or these findings are miraculous. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. I'll tell you, as someone who is doing research, five, 10 years ago, the practices I did, which I was supposed to do, which I was public about, which taught my students, spoke about in talks, uh, 
gradually it's come to light and some people knew this way back then some people just knew this more recently that these practices would tend to inflate the probability of us getting statistical uh, significance this came to be known as, a, as, as the replication crisis i know you have a chapter of it on your book where you could say well how do we know we were doing things wrong and the answer is because this the same findings we used to get when people try to replicate them uh they can't yeah do you think things that, so so you, you look at us now in 2021 there's still i assume there's still ted there's still journals there's still um you know social media are we getting better i th i think so because my sense is especially among like younger psychologists um like there's examples of my book of people who might have spent 10 or 20 years on one theory and then found out there's nothing there, which is like a pretty devastating thing to think about, to spend so much of your career on something like that. So I think the average like, you know, 30 year old young professor does not want to be in that situation. And partly because so social media brought us a lot of this hype. TED Talks brought us a lot of these hype. Yeah. What social media also brought was um, uh what, what one uh, preeminent social psychologist called methodological terrorism, which yeah. is this practice of, of writing mean blog posts and posts and doing mean tweets about statistically shoddy work, which can, of course, at its worst, lead to harassment and pylons, but is actually an important check. Because in the old days, if you had a problem with a paper that got studied, what, what you'd write a letter to the journal and, and hope they published it, which they probably wouldn't. I mean, they're, the options for critiquing bad research are, are myriad now in a way they weren't before, right? Yeah, and that's true. Um, the phrase methodological terrorism was used, the phrase replication bullies was used. And some of it, and as you're putting it, is like people like, I build my whole career off phenomena X. Yep. And then some twerps on Twitter start saying, I didn't do my stats right. And when they did the experiment, they don't get the phenomena X. And man, I worked for 40 years on this. This is my life work. And then, right. so, so you understand you get that reaction, a sort of, you know, you I don't know, get, get off my lawn reaction on the other hand the full story and i don't think you're disagreeing with this the full story actually does involve a lot of nastiness yeah. um i think it's no accident that that some of the people who are targeted for the most severe criticism tended to be young women there's there's a disproportionate there there's been a lot of nastiness i this isn't to say you know there's a line by the in the big lebowski you know you're not wrong. You're just an asshole. And a lot of the, a lot of the criticisms were people who were right, yeah. but they weren't very very nice about it. Um, let me so, so there's all sorts of you know. I wish we had hours, but but let me hit and let me just hit one thing that that I find most interesting, which is the implicit bias research. Because I bet everybody listening has heard uh, Hillary Clinton um, in in one of the presidential debate mentioned implicit bias when Merrick Garland was being confirmed some senator stood up and said so the psychology show everybody's racist are you saying i'm a racist and garland then responded with what with a fairly sophisticated understanding of this so so what do you, you know are, okay i'll ask you the question which i'm sure everybody listening to us has heard you know are we all racists yeah, I, 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 as they put it in avenue q i think everyone's a little bit racist it, it seems unlikely that um we you know, the brain is sort of a, a pattern making machine and, and it forms associations. I, you know, especially for me growing up in a white suburb, I'm, I'm sure I have some degree of implicit bias and certain associations uh, between black people and negative things or stereotypical things. The question of to what extent that affects my everyday behavior and can wash out all the other stuff that affects my behavior. That's one important question. Uh, the other important question is whether we have a tool that can measure my level of implicit bias accurately. And, and my chapter's argument is no, not really. So I, you know, one of the most frustrating things was I, I first wrote about the IAT in 2017. As I mentioned in the book, I got some responses from conservatives sort of crowing that this disproved implicit bias. But the analogy I always use is like, if I have a broken thermometer, that doesn't mean the concept of temperature is unimportant. It means that particular tool is not good at measuring it. And with implicit bias, we might not ever find a way that measures it, because I think it's probably a very complicated context dependent thing. But I, yeah, I think um, I'm calling everyone in the audience racist, just to be clear, to go on the record with this. I appreciate that. And I just take that personally. Um, so what, what I like about the book is, one of the many things I like about the book is that your your targets sort of cross all all of the political spectrum. So so you uh, you attack uh, 
the hype about um, the super predators. And I think a lot of, you know, conservative, a certain sort of kind of, kind of pissed at that. You certainly attack implicit bias and uh, which, which um, is something which a lot of liberals have bought into and are part of diversity training. And you roundly mock a lot of diversity training uh, that's built around implicit bias. That's, and you've been confirmed, by the way, in research that came out after your book was in press, but there's been some big studies by Betsy Pollock at Princeton and others finding that diversity training basically is a failure. And it might be a failure because it's founded off methods that are inadequate. So liberals have a lot to hate about your book, conservatives have a lot to hate. I, I guess I think optimists might have a lot to dislike about your book too. Like, isn't it kind of grim? So for instance, at one point you're talking about, about Angela Duckworth's work on grit and in your, you're, you're quite measured about it. You're quite, you, know, you say maybe it, is, maybe it isn't all as strong as some people say, but also, you, I think you're incredibly fair to her about her qualifications and everything. But one thing people like about, about the idea of grit is they imagine, well, you have these interventions, you make people more gritty and more tough, and then you do better off in the world. And you say, eh, it has very limited predictive power. And, you know, power posing is not going to help me. Building my self esteem is a disaster. And you know what really matters? And then you talk about things. You talk about the power of IQ, which is. I, intelligence, IQ as it measures intelligence is enormously predictive of all sorts of things. And you talk about society and all these societal forces and everything. And man, isn't that depressing? Like, <laughs> is, 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 is the news of your book, Give Up Hope? I mean, this and is part of the problem, not right? Not a bad like, subtitle. <laughs> give up, abandon hope, all you who enter. Abandon um, hope, yes. I mean, that's part of the problem, right? You would, I, I'm not gonna get a TED talk by saying, all this stuff sucks and doesn't really um, solve any problems. I, so first of all, like I do in a lot of these chapters, there's a kernel of truth. If your self-esteem is so low that you interpret every negative event in your life in apocalyptic terms, you should seek out cognitive behavioral therapy. And I think there's some good evidence for that. There's some good evidence for certain pharmaceuticals for, you know, personal mental health issues. Um, and, and even with grit, you know, the guys who really did the best job uh, critically analyzing grit pointed out that things like uh, tutoring or anti-tardiness interventions seem to have a bigger effect than anything on the grit menu. So there's always stuff we can do at the margins. But my point is like, um, I was pretty influenced by growing up in, in a pretty affluent suburb where I'm recording this from outside Boston. And I was such a screw up in high school. I didn't work hard. I, I was not gritty. I got, when I took the Duckworth test, I got 10%, 10th percentile in grit, which I think is absolutely accurate. Um, I just, I just had every advantage and it, it sort of gets me a little that someone could point to someone who had none of those advantages and say, well, what they need is more grit or they need to feel more powerful at work. I, I just think we should embrace a little bit of pessimism because that will show us a, a realistic path forward, I guess is how I put it. So, yeah, I mean, I get that. I mean, I, on the flip side, if, so you, so you, you kind of, um, there's various parts of the book where I think you very correctly criticize easy fix, quick fixes that are designed to make you more confident and more powerful, particularly if they're directed towards women and minorities and they doesn't solve your problems. And you point out that this is dismissive of real structural problems that aren't going to get fixed by, by, by changing your behavior in some simple way. But on the other hand, it also, it, it also seems kind of cruel to tell somebody, you know, you're just screwed, wait for society to get better. We should all yeah. put our energy in making society get better. And I would think, I mean, as somebody who sometimes benefits from self-help advice or you know, sort of things that work on the margins, that, that it's certainly better than nothing. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I also, there are times in the book when I point out that, um, in the, the chapter, Amy Cuddy and power posing in particular, I don't think the choice is really power posing or wait for society to treat women better. It, the, the problem is institutions are lazy and they don't actually want to look at why there might be like a pipeline problem or gender yeah. disparities. If you get a little bit more specific about why that pipeline problem exists. So, you know, we have great research out of Harvard, I think, showing that, um, in jobs that aren't really substitutable, where, where you know you have your attorney. If one day you you call them and they're like, no, uh, I'm Sheila, I'm your attorney today. You'd be like, no, I want my attorney. That's one of the reasons women get punished early in their careers around 26, 27, 28, when they wanna have kids. They fall behind men because they're often the ones who have to drop out to raise the kids. 
we can find ways to structure the workplace in fair or more equitable ways. We can try to get more paid parental leave. Those are sort of solutions somewhere between standing like uh, Wonder Woman and, and fixing society at the highest level. So I'm in favor yeah. of those sort of mid-range institutional solutions. So you'd be happy, I think. Well, there's two separate problems. One problem is, as you pointed out, a lot of psychology results are simply bogus. Like they're just not true. And there's nothing to be done about that. But there's some that are robust. And I think you would be, part of your sort of policy recommendations is don't, don't overhype them. It might well be, for instance, standing in an expansive pose. I don't know, but in an expansive pose, you know, expands my confidence and my, my feelings about myself. Maybe it doesn't do this with cortisol and hormones, but there was actually evidence it kind of maybe braces you up a bit. And yeah. if I just said that and then, and then didn't say much more, you'd be, you could live with that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think um, the mindfulness literature has maybe come under attack a little bit later. I'm not as familiar with that. But like if you told yeah. people, you know, the Dan Harris 10% happier thing, that if you embrace mindfulness, you'll get 10% happier. That's perfectly reasonable uh, thing to tell someone. But again, it probably won't get you a TED Talk. When, when Dan Harris wanted to write his book 10% Happier, he has this great story where his publisher wanted to call it something like Get Happy Now. And he was like, yeah. no, 10% happier. That's the, that's the pitch. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so I'm actually kind of curious what's not in your book and what is in your book. And because even in the story you told, you talked about an intervention, positive psychology intervention, which you thought very low of. But then there's another intervention grounded in good science that you were sort of more enthusiastic about. You made that contrast in, when you were describing it. And you earlier talked about interventions for, for like uh, clinical, like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, interventions for, for, for psychological problems. Um, you talked about nudges. This is a movement by behavioral economists to sort of fix our environment to, 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 to make us behave better. The obvious example you gave is, you know, if maybe kids would be better off if you make the desserts harder to get, you put them in back. Maybe an animal will be better off. You still choose the desserts, they just don't have them right in front. So am I right in thinking that, that, that what you're skeptical about isn't the power of psychology to change people's lives. It's the idea that little things can have big effects. Is that fair? Yeah, I'm actually, in almost any case, I'm skeptical of um, interventions that target individuals solving society level, like helping to solve societal problems. I'm not, so I'm not skeptical of talk therapy or CBT. I'm not skeptical of changing the environment or changing an institution, but um, solving social problems by targeting individuals, I'm almost always skeptical of. So, so basically, I just think psychology needs to scale back its claims considerably and just be much more careful in what it claims. But there, there's hope there. I mean, especially now that uh, there's a lot of methodological reform underway. Yeah. And, and there's sort of a, a why not both um, answer, which is, you know, psychology can work on the margins. If you're part of a group that is very bad, at, you know, statistically is, is worse than usual at, at asserting themselves or getting good or negotiating well or something, some sort of training could help this. But ultimately you wanna make the world such that, that the groups are treated differently and you wouldn't, sorry, identically in that regard and you wouldn't need the intervention. Yeah, so, and also the other thing that people, the step people often miss is they, they need to first prove that the lack of confidence is a problem in the first place. Throughout the book, people are like, oh, X is why Y is happening. So we should address X, but they don't even bother to fix X or, or uh, prove that X is the real problem. So there's a lot of leaps in logic. So some of the blame comes on the replication crisis, which is serious. And part of the blame comes from, well, bad actors, opportunists. You're, again, you're careful in the book not to say, you know, him or her, you know, is just doing it for the big bucks. But, but, but there are incentives. Everybody wants a job at a good place. Everybody wants the good book deal, wants the, 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 the popular TED Talk and so on. Do you think the ecology of, of the field, of, sorry, the ecology of actually the world has changed so that now, let me rephrase it. Back in the day, there was no TED Talks and there was no, um, there were not even sort of journals, there were not sexy journals. Um, there were no podcasts. You could be a really famous psychologist in psychology, and there was no, there was no, there was no incentive to overblow your results outside of professional fame. And 
I don't know what so you talk about societal interventions. If you could do something about, uh, well, you're a journalist, about the journalist ecosystem. You, why don't you? What, what would you tell? Forget about forget about telling me what I did wrong. Talk about yeah. talk to your journalist colleagues. What would you tell them? I mean, I have nothing but contempt for journalists. So I'm happy to to tee off here. Um, <laughs> No, we, we face a really difficult situation because like the whole institution of journalism is collapsing and it used to be, you know, even some mid-sized papers would have dedicated science reporters who could spend a yeah. lot of time talking to professors, talking to experts. There's still a few places like that. I mean, if you're a science writer at the New York Times, you have, I think, the time and space to do really good work. If you work at, you know... BuzzFeed does some good stuff, but if you work at BuzzFeed, you probably have to, well, I shouldn't even use BuzzFeed. Stephanie Lee is a great science reporter at BuzzFeed. A lot of these outlets, you have to write three, four, five times a day sometimes. So there's this um, uh, problem where you get shot PR press releases from like the Harvard press yes. office. And those press releases like inevitably overhype a given result. It's like, oh, did you know that... Uh, if you can get a white man to look at two kids of equal weight on a seesaw, it'll prime them to be more racially. It's just the, the stuff, especially like back in like 2012 that they were feeding us was ridiculous. Um, so if you're the journalist in that situation, you have every incentive to be like, oh my God, that's amazing and type it up and publish it. And, and you probably don't have the skills to like, like I'm not good at statistics, but I have basic statistical training. Like I know what a regression yeah. table is, what statistically significant means. A lot of people writing about science don't have that. So I think it's a really, it's a grim situation. And I'm, I'm much more hopeful about psychology improving itself than about science writing improving itself. Because I, I don't think there's any, unfortunately, there's not much hope for science writing right now, just because given the collapse of everything. Because psychology could create internal incentives. Yeah. I could get a bad reputation if I don't do my work properly. The journalists could turn me away. But science journalism, the incentive is, you know, getting a lot of readers and so on. So there's no, it's very hard to block people from writing popular articles. Yeah. And I, I think that problem's maybe gotten worse. Um, I know the trendy thing is to say that like everything's always been politicized. So like saying stuff has gotten politicized doesn't mean anything. But I don't think, I think stuff has gotten more politicized and a lot more science writing, including on things like the IAT, you can sort of sense the influence of politics and of being on the right side of a debate rather than attempting to yeah. pour through the evidence dispassionately. If I have one complaint, one specific complaint about science writing, it's a study comes out, a good study, you know, good well done study, and then writers write about it as if it's some sort of major discovery and it gets described and, and broadly Represent. And this isn't a case of overblowing something, but but the reality is that real progress in, in any science um, is a result of accumulation of, yeah. of research upon research. Upon research. A great study comes out showing me something unintuitive. I, I say, okay, that could be true. But until 20 more and 100 more come out, I don't yeah. start to shift my mind. But I know so many people come up to me and said, so and so is true because I read about it in the New York Times, you know. But, but let me ask you, so, so in some ways, psychologists either have the good luck or bad luck to have caught your attention. What if instead you wrote exactly the same book, but it was about uh, advice on what to eat or medicine in general? Wouldn't exactly the same issues come up? I think so, yeah. I mean, my sense is a lot of fields are having replication crises. Uh, Stuart Ritchie wrote a book called Science yeah. Fictions uh, over the summer. It came out. I was worried that it would sort of step on my book's toes, but his is, is as much about, um, I think, like cell biology, yeah. Western or Western blots, a thing. Does that sound familiar? It's like so, something how you uh, look at stuff under a microscope. There's all kinds of fraud. Are you asking about cell biology, Jeff? <laughs> I'm asking Paul Bloom about <laughs> cell Really taking advantage of your expertise. Um, yeah, I'm like a I professor think... on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's a reference. I think these problems are endemic in a lot of different areas of science. I just, I argue in the books, psychology is particularly important um, just because of how obviously it impacts everything from like HR at work to educational interventions. But yeah, I think I could probably write the same book about other yeah. subjects and have no plans on doing no. so. There's been these replication studies where finding, you know, so-and-so psychology studies don't replicate. You do them again, you don't get the same finding and the numbers, mm -hmm. you know, vary. Um, but then they do these things with cancer research. And yeah. I don't know, psychology might be important, but cancer research is really That's important. True. And, and the failure rate in these studies is disastrously high because they deal also, medical research deal also with another set of incentives, some of which are, you know, 
quite blatant and and that really matters this, um, this is probably um, something i shouldn't admit as somebody who's supposed to be intellectually curious but i have I've literally had the thought, I am not going to look into the cancer research replication crisis because it will be too depressing. I'm just like, yeah. I, I get too much. Yeah, um, no, same. Um, I want to move it to Q&A, but before I do, is there anything that that, that you really want to say about the book that hasn't been covered yet? No, I mean, I, I hope people check it out and like it. Um, the, the goal, so there, it is a negative book in the sense of criticizing a lot of stuff, but the goal is to sort of, to use a self-help word. I'd like to empower people to know what questions to ask their superintendent or their boss or their commanding officer. And I, I think the book does a good job at that, but we'll, um, we'll see what people say after the, more of them read it. I think the book does a very good job of that. Thank you. So um, do we press a button to move to Q&A? How does that happen? We don't press a button. That doesn't even make any what sense. do we lose when someone like Jesse writes for Substack instead of mainstream publications? Um, you know, that's complicated. It's a very weird time. I, I can make a much better living writing fewer words for Substack than I could for mainstream publications. I'm not like some of these other people who have been like fired or pushed out. I really, I left New York Mag because I got a book deal and I'm really lucky. What worries me is like, if everyone has their own siloed ecosystem, everyone's on Substack behind a paywall, everyone's on Patreon behind a paywall. I think there's gonna be less and less talking to one another to hash out disagreement. And I think that's like a real weak point of journalism right now. So that, that does worry me a lot. Cool. Uh, we have another question that came in from the Q&A. And just a quick reminder to anyone listening, you can drop questions in the Q&A feature or in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can by the end of the hour. Um, but this question is for you, Jesse. To what extent do you think the problem of the field is a problem of a certain kind of character that isn't necessarily representative of the field, but the most visible and well-funded? That's a really good question. And, and so what I've been telling people is like one of the, you know, this isn't really a character-driven book, but it does have some characters. And, and you can tell the difference, I think, between let me just say like Angela Duckworth, when it turned out there were flaws in her research, I think she genuinely handled that well. And I have some qualms with how she's presented her research on grit, but I think that's like a real character moment. Like you've been working on this thing for a while. Maybe it's made you a little bit rich. There's a threat to it. How do you respond to that? Do you double down or do you hear out your critics? So I think that's the, the character element that I think is important, especially with like the real celebrity psychologists who are the most successful and maybe the least just might overblow their findings a little bit. I'm being careful not to name names. If you want the names, you got to read uh, the book. But yeah, I think that's a good question. So there's a question by uh, Yulia, which um, which kind of nicely connects to that. Which she, it, it, it's actually a clever a clever question. Um, what do you do about run called runaway ideas? Which is, you know, I'm a psychologist. I, I put out some some a study comes very popular, and I just oh, I made a mistake or everyone else says I made a mistake. I, say, ah, I overstated it or it's not true at all, but it's out there and it's through eternity. There are, these, there are these cases where these papers have tens of thousands of citations and then the failures to replicate or even the retraction is, is obscure. Yeah. So it's sort of zombie psychological ideas. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's one of those areas where the field just needs to develop much better internal policing and internal incentives because from my experience watching the knowing like since about 2015 the creators of the implicit association test have said like it's too noisy to diagnose individuals six years later it's still being used in that way and, and there's such a gap between what the research shows and, and how these ideas continue to unfurl themselves in the public and then there's a bunch of people without the credentials who will write take off ideas that do well on Amazon. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I've noticed it's a really big problem because it, it, debunking these ideas does not seem to actually debunk them in terms of their impact on the world. So that's not a satisfying answer, but I, it's a really good question. Yeah, and people, you know, people talk about in some way technological fixes for this where journal articles appended to a journal article when you download it are all the critiques or there's ongoing peer review where you could see, you know, see a journal article and see all the comments that follow from it. I'm not sure that that's going to solve the problem from a, from a societal yeah, uh, point of view. Yeah, skeptical. Though, you know, who, 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 reads, who reads the articles? Um, I got more questions if we don't have more coming through. Ooh, um, we've got a couple. They're coming oh, okay. in via Q&A. Oh, okay. Um, wow, they're all coming in now. This is great. 
Uh, so Jesse, was there a particular psychology fad that was the quote unquote straw that broke the camel's back and made you write the book? Yeah, I mean, not to keep bringing it back to this, but it was the, it was the implicit association test. Um, a, a guy who worked for, um, I think, Innovations for Poverty Action at MIT reached out to me. He had some background in psychology, and he basically just suggested I look into the IIT and, and said that the evidence was a lot weaker than people had made it out to be. And that was sort of my... Um, What's the, Paul, what's the matrix reference I'm looking for? I don't want to say red pill moment because that is other kind of- It's one of the pills, but don't get the pill <laughs> wrong. I never, I never get it. Yeah, I, I, right. That was the moment I became red pill. I became a men's rights <laughs> activist. Uh, no, that was the moment I, I realized that a lot of this stuff uh, might be weaker than it appeared. And from once you notice it, you sort of see it everywhere. And once you start to notice the characteristics of overhyped research, it's just not hard to find. Okay. I'll say something else just because I noticed there's a, uh, I was looking at the participants and there's a very well-known um, evolutionary psychologist uh, amongst us. I won't out the person, but, um, but one of the problems that you mentioned in your book actually is that a lot of the, the work that's most questionable doesn't have much of a theoretical framework. Well, research that comes out from like evolutionary theory cognitive science, neuroscience, from sort of more built up theoretical frameworks and aren't just kind of gee whiz connections, tends to be more robust and tends to, tends to have more staying power. That's not a I, question. No, Do no, I, I, I totally agree. And what's interesting is um, uh, there's a, a field of social priming, which suggests that these subtle influences um, you know, you flash a word for a hundred milliseconds, it can affect people's attitude in a profound way. This is, field has not replicated at all, but one of the studies I love is you look at a statue of the thinker, you know, the guy thinking, and that makes you less religious by like 20 points on a hundred point religiosity scale. And that's, th th what theory could possibly explain you look at a statue and suddenly you don't believe in God anymore. It just, it makes no sense versus, evolutionary psychology, which obviously is controversial in some contexts and misused, but you could actually like compare a finding to, does this fit into what we know about the evolved human brain? So I do think a lack of any theoretical basis has been a pretty big problem, or like the thinnest theoretical basis has been a big problem in uh, social psychology in particular. Uh, more questions coming in. Uh, this one kind of dovetails with that, but in your discussions with psychologists, especially those who are critical of these fads, do they talk about things that need to change in the field as a whole in order to stop these types of fads from proliferating? Yeah, I mean, one of the most straightforward answers to that is just changing the statistical tools that are used. And, and this gets a bit above my pay grade, but basically um, you make it harder to prove stuff or for stuff to be significant. And, and you can do that by changing the threshold at which something's significant. You can change to uh, what's known as a Bayesian approach, which has to do with, um, Basically, before you test something, you predict, you say, how likely do we think it is that this thing is true? And that can affect the math and make it harder for to generate false positives. So I think that's the most straightforward result. And then there's also that sort of internal conversation about the ethics of, of giving misleading quotes or giving misleading TED Talks. So I think those are the main things. I don't, Paul might have something to add there. No, it's a good list. I mean, another one is incentives within the field. So it's hard to change this because the alternatives are never really clear, but, but right now the field is, puts tremendous priority on how much you publish yeah. and, and how many times you're cited, your, your citation count, your H index, which is a measure of citation. And there are a lot of places that for jobs, it has to be this high. And for tenure, it has to be this high. And you wanna pump out papers, but in order to pump out papers, you have to have findings. And in order to have findings, sometimes nature is not cooperative and you gotta, so, and, and so it, 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 it motivates shoddy research. And then people say, well, okay, we're just gonna start rewarding, you know, rewarding quality uh, rather than quantity. Well, you know, okay, that's what we all wanna do, but it's much easier said than that. There's, there's a young researcher in a different, dropping my book, in a different field. Um, I'm not going to name him or get into this, but he basically he found this one data set and then he managed to torture it in all sorts of different ways to generate attention getting findings that he gets published everywhere. And it's just the worst, lowest quality work, but people will publish it and he's quickly building up a name for himself just by doing that. And it's not, it's not good for science. All right. Thinking about um, what we were just discussing, 
Uh, do you think you could have written a book like The Quick Fix a generation ago? Um, in other words, have the scientific methods, media landscape, and so on conspired to produce a very new and specific kind of problem? Paul would know better than I would. I think the, the statistics and methods problems have always been there. I think, as he said, it was really around the turn of the century that we got like the, the present incarnation of the celebrity social psychologist or the celebrity psychologist and TED Talks and stuff. My sense is there's always been psychological fads, but maybe the, the spoils are much richer than they used to be. Do you think that's right, Paul? I think that's right. I think it's also the case. I have colleagues who say, for some fields of psychology, you take a look at research in the 60s and 70s and 80s and maybe 90s, and you throw out most of it. Most of it's based on shoddy statistics, too small sample sizes, um, weird analytic choices, and very little of it holds up. And, you know, we're talking about this in kind of a freewheeling, critical way, but, but you, talk, you know, Mickey Inslet was uh, is one of the psychologists, uh, a friend of mine talking in this uh, this podcast. And he, he talked about the crisis in social psychology. He talked about spending most of his professional life studying phenomena that probably don't exist. Yeah. You know, one of them being ego depletion, another one being stereotype threat. And these are a lot of, you know, and people in good faith worked on it. And before recently, people just didn't know that they were doing it wrong. And, you know, it, it's it's sort of personally and professionally devastating. And I have some sympathy for people who react very harshly to the criticism that we're coming out. I, just last night, coincidentally, I was re-listening to the Radio Lab um, about stereotype threat, where Mickey yes. Inslee comes across as like the guy with the biggest conscience of all, because he's just straightforwardly like, there might be nothing here, but um, that's a really good sort of uh, hour of radio for anyone hoping to understand this problem better. Yeah. In that vein, uh, do you have any suggestions for how non-psychologists can develop a better sense of which results to trust and to what degree without themselves having to become experts? I think this is the situation where like a, a little bit of statistics, statistics is scary. I hate statistics. I don't believe in numbers. It's all fake. Paul can confirm all that. Um, but having a little bit of a knowledge of it, of basic ideas, like what significance is, and the difference between statistically significant and having like a, a real world relevant effect size, sample size, all that basic stuff. Like it's surprising how often once you just have a little bit of training, you can, you can sniff out potential weaknesses. And that doesn't make you an expert debunker, but it just gives you more questions to ask people, I think. And, and also just like, I don't know, I think evolutionary psychology, like once you learn a little bit more about the more you read about human nature in general, anthropology, sociology, whatever else, the more you will be skeptical of people who claim they can change human nature, human behavior very easily, because it is not an easy thing to do. We've got a question in the chat from Anne, who writes that a lot of the disconnect seems to happen between scholars and practitioners. Uh, for example, some of the worst versions of implicit bias training are developed by non-academics. The industry that popularizes psych often has fewer checks and balances than academia. How can scholars put the brakes on that kind of bad knowledge translation? That's really tough. And, and you know, something similar happened with grit, where if you type grit into the Amazon search bar, it's like all these people with no psych training going on and on about how important grit is. Um, you know, I, I think maybe some psychologists could just take on more of a watchdog role. And, and when they see lay people abusing these concepts or misunderstanding them, just, just speak up and say so. Because as, um, as the question asker points out, like a lot of the damage being done isn't being done by psychologists per se. It's by, you know, the human resource managers or whatever who don't really understand this stuff. And, and in, you know, in my book, in the chapter on comprehensive soldier fitness, I read, um, you know, Marty Seligman, in my view, didn't have a great understanding of, of PTSD, but it was really army personnel who were not psychologists who really allowed this program to metastasize. And thinking of comprehensive soldier fitness as an example, um, Yvonne is wondering how worried are you about bad psychology influencing policy in America? Very, I mean, I, I, I think, I just think it still is. I think we still act like um, we have a huge amount of evidence. Implicit bias can account for these much more complicated disparities. I think the the 
vitally important conversation on race is manifesting as these diversity trainings that have no theoretical underpinning and that often induce really negative responses in participants, which is not what you're supposed to do when you're trying to have a delicate, important conversation. So I'm very worried about that. I, I think the average person out there in the world probably doesn't think that they could be like someone who studies quantum mechanics. I think the average person probably thinks they have a really good grasp on human psychology and what motivates people, but it's very easy to fool ourselves because we often don't even know what motivates ourselves. Here's a question I think um, both Jesse and Paul, I'd love to hear from you on. Um, to what extent do you think the quick fix issue is aggravated by the way academia incentivizes young psychologists to create their own theories versus trying to replicate previous findings? Take this one, Paul. I, you probably have good thoughts. Yeah, I, there, there are several proposals out there that say that graduate students, for instance, every graduate student should should uh, have to replicate a study in order to or try to replicate means do it again and see what happens in order to get a PhD. And there should be much more focus on, um, on replication than original work. Um, you know, I, I'm going to give an answer, which is maybe um, more old school than, than you were expecting for this, which is, I think, making genuine discoveries about the world, about how the mind works, um, many of them which have, which have no practical use, but just involve sort of subtle theoretical points about, about visual perception or, or language learning. And so to develop original theories is extremely exciting and important. It's what, you know, to some extent, our fields of science. And I think replication is absolutely important work. But if I had to choose as a colleague, somebody who's done a lot of very careful replications and careful analyses versus somebody who has done careful, robust work and made discoveries, I choose the one making discoveries. Now, of course it's not either or, and maybe there should be more emphasis on, on replication, but actual like, exciting theoretical work is what we're here for. And, and with people like Jesse, you know, as people like Jesse pointed out, we have to be careful when we do it and not overstate it and not do, not do it poorly. But if it's done well, it's the best. Yeah, I, I can't really add to that. That was a good answer. Um, here's kind of a, an, a fun question, <laughs> if you're willing to entertain it. Um, we've have someone curious what drink they should pair with while reading the quick fix? <laughs> oh man, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm sort of a whiskey guy. Um, so like, it could be a nice classy, like sort of shaking the, the ice or whatever. Um, Hefeweizen is my beer. I like very weedy beers, not, uh, yeah, I'm not a masculine beer drinker, unfortunately. Paul, what would you go with? I think you should read the book while doing shots. And <laughs> And every time it's you fail to replicate, you do a shot. Yeah, every time you hear TED Talk, you do a shot, and then you go through the book. I, well, I, t I told this to the guys on Two Psychologists Four Beers, but like to keep drinking in Brooklyn affordable, I do the shot. You can get like a shot and a beer for six dollars. So maybe we could combine the two of them. That's right. That's this right. Is very highbrow stuff. <laughs> Got a few more. We've got it seems a lot of uh, psychologists with us tonight. <laughs> Which is very exciting. Um, yeah, I recognize some names on our participant list. Uh, I'm gunning for you, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got one from Derek who says, in some fields like physics, one usually needs to replicate really exciting results before building upon that work. How thoroughly do new insights in psychology get vetted? I mean, my, this strikes me as a kind of area where things might be improving. Um, Throughout my book, there are examples of like fields. I'm thinking of like power posing in the IAT where like it seemed like they were able to pretty quickly build up like five or six pretty solid seeming studies. And then it took a while for the failed replications to come in. And I, I think that just, unfortunately, it sort of seems like researchers who are excited about something study it differently than researchers trying to do like a, an actual replication. And I think that accounts for this, this lag time because in a lot of these fields, like, or, you know, two or three years in, they'll do this really impressive literature review, right? Where there'll be like 15 or 20 studies pointing to the same effect. And then somehow 10 years later, it's like, whoops, we were totally wrong about that. So that worries me because, because science should work in that way, where if you can show over and over and over again, you've shown something that it's real. Um, the problem is like things like publication bias, where in the background, a bunch of people are failing to find that effect, but those, those 
papers go in the file drawer. But um, I don't know. Do, do you think there's there's hope for improvement on that front, Paul? I think I think there is. I also think you're right. But for whatever reason, even putting aside the sort of sexy work you're talking about, scientific findings tend to go through the following pattern where originally there's a set of really powerful findings, really strong, convincing effects. And then over time, they get less and less and less powerful. Yeah. Um, there's one psychologist, Jonathan Schooler, who who says somewhat jokingly that God hates you know good findings, and if you get your findings are too good, he strikes back and kind of <laughs> makes them less and less powerful. The universe, the universe corrects itself. I don't think that's what happens. I think it's it's often publication bias where exciting stuff gets published, and then later on, more careful researchers and so on. But yeah, that's that's going to be a pattern you're going to see, and I think it shows up in, in sciences other than psychology as well. Which is another reason why journalists shouldn't take too seriously initial findings that are very exciting. Yeah. All right. I think we've got time for two more questions this evening. Um, one is coming from someone uh, deeply involved in the field who has shared the book with her students um, and has actually had to warn her students to carefully consider how publicly they should discuss it because she's concerned about them encountering blowback that they didn't anticipate. Any advice for folks in the field with not enough status or power to weather canceling? Uh, bl Blowback in terms of, well, I mean, I have encountered this weird thing of like not, you shouldn't criticize more senior scholars. And I think that's maybe where some of the sort of so-called methodological terrorism things come in, like this idea that these are the established guys, you, you shouldn't criticize them. I think that's another area where things are improving a little bit, but I was... Early, earlier on in my career reporting on this stuff, it always surprised me. Like I, I had this, maybe one of my first stories that ever got like a little bit of national attention. There was this um, exciting research on gay marriage and basically how to change people's minds on it that turned out to be based on totally fabricated data. And a guy named um, David Brockman, a uh, professor at Berkeley now, I think Berkeley, uh, he, he cracked it wide open. And it, you would think this would be like a career defining find. He discovered fraud. But there was a guy named Donald Green, a political science at Columbia, who he would have to criticize uh, to, it, it just shocked me because in journalism, that's not true at all. Like if we discover one of our colleagues has done something wrong, we're, we're, we're like vultures. So um, I, don't, I don't know, Paul, do you have advice for how to address that? I was going to give more practical advice, which is you should sell a book jacket, maybe of like Danny Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, or something, <laughs> a really popular book in psychology, and they can wrap it around your book. Um, yeah. while, while reading it. I think more, more seriously, um, there's certainly so much psychology, so much intelligent people in the field now being very critical. Um, we mentioned uh, uh, the, 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 re the recent book, uh, Science Fiction. Um, and there, people will not be as, some individuals will be upset about some of Jesse's arguments, but the general idea we could be criticized this work isn't taboo. I think the students have nothing to worry about. All right, I kind of lied. We've got two more questions. Um, how, dare, how dare you? One, well, we've, it's a very important question. Uh, to what degree do you think journalists' swift acceptance of a lot of these things is indicative of a larger ongoing corrosion of journalism? I bet if we could like go on Nexus and pull a lot of science reporting from the 1980s, it would be just as bad. It's just the pace and the volume of everything is picked up. I mean, I'm contradicting myself a little bit because there were more dedicated science journalists back in the eighties, but I, you know, I talk about the self-esteem craze and the super predators crazes from the eighties and nineties that were reported on just as credulously. So um, yeah, I just completely lost my train of thought. What was it? What was the question I've yet to answer? Uh, do you think um, journalist ex acceptance of these oh, yeah. is ongoing? Overall? Yes. I, I think things have gotten worse just because, you know, so many 50 something newspaper veterans who really know how to report have been laid off. And it's more and more uh, young kids who could do great reporting if they had the resources, but are never trained to do it and, and don't have the resources. So I'm worried that that, that side of it is gonna get worse for sure. I mean, I, 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 Jesse knows this more than I do and, I, I, and he might be right in the aggregate, but now there are so many people writing on science and they're no longer happy part of the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, they could, be, they could be bloggers anywhere. And so some of the sharpest, most critical, smartest voices on science are people who um, 
who are just outside of academia. They're just really smart, often self-taught, uh, uh, often diverse, different ages, very young, very old. And so I think maybe the average is worse than it was 20 years ago, but I think among the best now is better than the best in the past. Does that fit your sense? Yeah, well, there are definitely more like, you know, uh, some dude will do a random medium study and it'll turn out he really was able to debunk an established finding. I, there's definitely way more of that. And these sort of like really smart quant guys and gals, I'm worried a lot of them can't really, they have to do something else to like make money and to make a living. Yes. I, I'm worried there's fewer opportunities to like, you know, do good skeptical science writing for a living. But I think somebody like say, um, uh, Scott Alexander Siskind, who yeah. now has a, was game under Slate Star Codex, now has a Substack writes about all sorts of topics, including psychiatry, and is, a, I think, a really sharp observer of psychiatric research, talks a lot about medications and so on. And he's just doing his own thing. He's not, in, he doesn't work in a, in a newspaper, doesn't work, just, he can do that. You can do that now. And he wouldn't have existed, like 25 years ago, he, I, would, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have existed, right. Because who else, he was a practicing psychiatrist who would also write 5,000 word essays on antidepressants. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. What's There's he going to do, hand them out on a street corner? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. The last question for the end of tonight is for both Paul and Jesse. What are you working on next? You go first. Yeah. I need to I'll go first. I guess we, end, we end with you. Um, I have a book um, coming out in November called uh, The Sweet Spot, um, The Pleasures of Suffering and the Meaning of Life. And it's about why we enjoy suffering and why sometimes we enjoy suffering and why suffering can give our life meaning. Right. So that, that's, Sounds... that's my big project coming out. Sounds a lot more uplifting than my book. Um, oh, how I, could it not be? <laughs> I am continuing to publish a weekly podcast on internet garbage, very different from any of this. I would uh, block and report it, check it out if you haven't. Uh, I would love to write another book. I have some larval ideas, but we will see uh, if my brain and the market can uh, affect that outcome. But I'm very excited I got to publish this book and uh, want to thank Paul and thank everyone for uh, for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank Jesse, you both. This was great. Um, just do quick last plug. If you want to get Jesse's book, there's a link in the chat. You can get it on bookshop.org, but also highly recommend Paul's book against empathy. It is a yeah. Chevalier staff favorite. Thank you. Um, and thank you again for everyone for coming. All right. Cheers. Thanks everyone.